I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Bill and Ted face the music came out. Yes. We, we promised this last time. Uh, so I had the feeling that there's going to be at least light spoilers here. So if you haven't seen it yet, just be prepared. There are going to be spoilers because the favorite part of the movie for me, or my favorite part of the movie is a spoiler, but not anything plot related. It's the, the murder robot being just a ball of anxiety. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. What was his name? What oh, was his name? Jesus. Oh God. Uh, like John, Gene Michael or something like that. Something like that. that um, it was that, and that, like, the, the moment when he killed the wrong person the second time and he goes like, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> like it totally changed. It was so good. That's, um, that's my favorite part of the movie. And then when he does like his nervous dance. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, fucking, I love that dude. Uh, Dennis Caleb McCoy. Yes, Dennis Caleb. <laughs> They're like, how are you even here? Like, can robots You're stop? You're a robot. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, that was very good. Uh, I thought that movie was phenomenal. I thought um, Bill and Ted's daughters were amazing. Yes. Very well like, played. Really great. Really great characters. Um. Christian Shaw was a welcome surprise in the role that she was in. Oh, yes. Welcome surprise. Uh, they also unveiled some facts about Rufus that surprised me. There, yeah. They, they, the, he made an appearance and it was the way I would have assumed that they would have done it where he's I, like. I, well, so I read that they were going to do like a Carrie Fisher, um, the guy who's in charge of the Death Star type thing. Yeah. Um, General Moth. I forget his actual actor's name. Mm. But um, they, I read they were going to do something like that, but they were like, that's way too expensive for a movie based uh, on a 90s comedy film. Yeah. that that's <laughs> I, I can see how accounting could uh, step in and go, hang on. They're like, you do know this is a Bill and Ted movie, correct? The last one didn't do great. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was it was good it, it had the same feeling that the other ones had which was very yeah. good it was extreme i will say the movie was extremely linear but then again if you've watched bill and ted that was a very linear movie as well yeah there's um uh, I, I did like the uh the couple's therapy where they're like when we when i suggest uh you bring your wife in is this what you thought i meant yeah. <laughs> it, it reminded me of uh, Step Brothers, the ending of Step Brothers, where uh, uh, the, the, the psychiatrist or psychologist girlfriend was like, you realize how fucked up this is, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mine's good. not screen accurate, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Bill and was... Ted face the music. I actually really like the way that they handled like how they brought about world peace with their music. Yeah. Um, because it, 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 it got away from the whole tribute problem. There's, you know oh, what I mean? It got rid of the tribute problem. I was surprised Weezer, the Weezer song wasn't in the movie. So I guess they paid Weezer to write that song just as an ad for that movie. I liked the Weezer song. It was fine. I was just surprised that it didn't play a part. I did like I'm... that they, they went like, oh, here's like... Uh, um, like all these famous, like like historical musicians, and then they go back to the present, and they're like, "Oh, hey, it's Kid Cudi." And it's like, wait, yeah, yeah. And he and was Kid Cudi's pl playing like this super hyper intelligent, like fully yeah. understands quantum theory. Yeah, I was like, oh shit, well, they're gonna have like this crazy band, and then Kid Cudi's gonna join in, and then that was, they did not do that. He was like, "Oh, I'll let me explain this part of quantum th whatever for you." 
To be fair, that was probably the funniest possible, uh, probably the funniest possible application of Kid Cudi. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Like, <laughs> it was really good. The, um, I, I do think that the segments of, uh, the film where they went and gathered the band were a little bit not it wasn't the best but then again it's not awful you know what i mean yeah there, there's one or two th- points where i was like huh like uh, but i i got it yeah it didn't but i liked it, it it didn't take away from the film those parts but it didn't necessarily add to it yes that's that's honestly the way i feel about it too yeah um, but it was good. I, I super recommend it to anyone who wants to see it. There's yeah, and totally we didn't really worth it. spoil anything. No, I mean now they're aware that um, they Kid have Cuddy's daughters and Kid Cudi's in it, and the, ro- the robot trailer, has anxiety. Though, all of that, all of that's in there except for the anxiety robot. Yeah, but that comes up at a really funny point. So, and the lead up to it is hilarious. Oh yes, like. That's that honestly that section of the movie is my favorite section of the movie that particular time period that they're in. Uh I agree. Totally. Totally yeah, totally. Really funny. A slight oh. plot hole though. How What's... did they get the USB stick? I didn't see anyone I didn't see anyone making a USB drive. Oh like what like how did they what do you yeah, mean? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They were presented... I remember when they were presented with it. Do you mean, like, how did they plug it in? No, no. How did they... How did... Okay, so there's actually two problems I have with that. Is it that it broke? So is the uh, question, n- how, how did they repair it? No, 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 no. No, they didn't repair it. Um, the question is, who recorded that, first of all? Oh, I got and you. And second of all... Uh, that that format that, that that standard for USB would almost certainly be uh, out of date at the time of the in, at the end of the movie, at the point at the point in the movie in which they got it. The point Spoiler. of the movie, yes, but they they when they got it, it didn't necessarily have to be from the time in which they got it. It could have been recorded at a different time than brought. All right, there. you know what? We're we're talking so once you get into actual tra- time travel elements in movies, it gets really shitty. Yeah. <laughs> I I honestly honestly I feel like most plots are not made better by time travel. No. As a as a rule. Like like it's to the point that in the Harry Potter franchise, uh JK Rowling realized what she had done and destroyed every every single instance of a time traveling mechanism in her world because she was like oh this is way too powerful yeah so like this, and then she ruined it the with a cursed destroyer. child yeah T- time travel just destroys plots yeah um, oh i did like is that death is he playing hopscotch by himself and cheating, cheating. Yeah. <laughs> Death would totally cheat at Hopscotch. There's oh, no yeah. about it. For um, sure. Yeah. But anywho, I think it's time to start the podcast for real. Um, This is Cryptopedia. We talk about spoopy things generally. Very spoopy. Uh, spoopy yeah, monsters. John. Spoopy ghosts. I'm Brandon. Uh, spoopy acts of the human condition. Um, So this week's thing because it's not really a cryptid and it's okay. not we'll get into is it is it an object uh, the, it is technically a living being or at least at one point it was how is something uh, technically at it was technically at one point alive uh so the first sighting was in 1883 is this a tree because i did a spoopy plant once no 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 no, no it's not All a spoopy right. plant it's not sp- i did see the uh central american equivalent of that spoopy plant and I thought about doing it for a hot second, but I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, so the taxonomy of this is a little bit weird. There are two distinct entities in this sighting. So there's a humanoid and a camel. And its region is Arizona. Brandon, if you guess this, I will be astounded. Is this... 
like a real life version of like Joe Camel, like the Camel Cigarettes cartoon guy. It's way darker. It's darker? Is it is it like It's darker than Joe Camel. What is this some kind of like Arizona Camel homunculus? No, no. Okay, so they're two separate entities. There's a humanoid entity and a camel entity. Okay. They're not it's this is not a chimera. There's no Is it There's no chimeric reactions. There's no Nina in this story. Some version of Arizona Bigfoot because every freaking 100 feet has a regionally specific Bigfoot. So I'm going to go regionally specific Arizona Bigfoot, which I'll call the um what's what the fe- the 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 Phoenix ape. And um the and then the, for the camel entity, uh I'm just going to say it's an out of it's an a little an actual camel, so like an out of place animal. So, uh, first of all, the regional variety of Bigfoot in Arizona is the Tucson Wild Boy. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not, but I think it would be funnier if it was from Tucson. Because um, Tucson's a funnier word. Yeah, Tucson uh, Wild Boy. I thought you were, I didn't get that you made that up for a second. I thought it was really the <laughs> Tucson Wild Boy. Um, but no, no, this week's episode is the Red Ghost or the Phantasma Colorado. Okay. Wait. Hang on. Hang it, on. It's it's in Arizona. Is there a place called Colorado, Arizona? No, 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 no. Did it travel? No, 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 no. It's no, a no. ghost that likes road trips. I don't I didn't actually figure out why it was called the 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 Phantasma Colorado because that's what um that's what the Spanish speaking residents called it. And it actually makes literally no sense. Because this takes place in the southeast portion of of Arizona, so it's not even like bordering Colorado. Uh, I, I'm just googling. Um, I don't want to know how to say Colorado in Spanish. I don't know what it means in Spanish. Uh, I mean, Colorado, Colorado. is of Sp- Spanish origin, meaning uh, colored red. Oh, okay. Well, that explains it then, because then it, that that means it's the red ghost in in Spanish. Gotcha. Okay. Fan- Phantasma Colorado ghost that is also red. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Mystery okay. solved. That mystery has been solved. Well done. That was a judicious use of Googling. Yes. Um, so uh, it's, in the, it's in the folder. The and, red right. ghost. How is it? So this. Hmm? Oh, sorry. I forgot it was two different things. I just read taxonomy. Uh, humanoid and camel, and I was like, "How?" And they was, "Oh yeah, it's two different things." Yeah, it's it's. This is gonna be a weird one. Okay. Um, so this week we're heading west, in the United States at least. This story is not really supernatural, but it's certainly strange. And I'm gonna give you a content warning at the top of this week's episode. There's animal abuse in this story. Ah, um, what did yeah. they do to deserve that? Those nasty ass animals. Well, the animals did nothing. It's just a bunch of, I'm assuming, white I don't people know. in the American West. We'll see what the animal is, and I'll decide if they deserved it or not. I mean, you already know what the animal is. I already said what the animal is at the top. I didn't bury that lead. Is that like the like the, the, the folklore between, of why um camels have uh, the humps on their back? They're really like some, some white person is like punched in the back real hard, and then just all I mean, camels I after assume... him. I mean, I assume... Okay. I assume, I assume that's why, I, I I assume something awful white person did is generally the case. Okay, for explaining most things. Um, so a tributary of the Gila River, Eagle Creek, is located in the southeast corner of Arizona, approximately in the middle of nowhere. Like for real, I checked Google Maps for a virtual trip down the river, and I saw maybe ten buildings top on its sixty mile path. Oh, geez. Now, yeah, here's a it, question. Was it a camel or a dromedary? We're not getting there yet. But, okay. Also, a drom- I, I think, isn't a dromedary just a different type of camel? It's the number of humps. It's a, I think it's a single hump. Yeah, a one hump is a dromedary and a two hump is a camel. It, okay, I looked up the dictionary thing for dromedary. Noun, an Arabian one-humped camel, Brandon. Uh, okay, so then what's a two-humped camel called? Uh, there are 
they have a separate name. Um, uh, the a uh, Bactrian camel. All right, Bactrian. Okay. Bactrian. Gotcha. They're more. They're more like central. They're more like they're nor more northern than the dromedaries, which are more like um, Africa, Middle East. Whereas the um, the Bactrians are more like Asia, Asiatic. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. To say that the first sighting of this entity was in a remote location is perhaps the understatement of the century. Okay. So, at the time of the sighting, the Arizona Territory is only 20 years old in 1883. Oh, so it's like settlers, settler time. They're yeah, settling. yeah. It's do you Catan time. Yeah. Um, so, it was still a full 29 years away from statehood. And not only that, but Geronimo, the uh, Apache leader, was active in the region at the time. And it is, in fact, used as a framing device in this week's primary source from the April 1961 edition of American Heritage magazine, The Red Ghost, by Robert Froman. Now, I want to point something out here. This yes. article has a shitload of casual racism. Oh, I've been sitting on an episode for a while because it is loaded with it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not going to go into it. Like, I'm not going to... You can tell the story without the casual racism uh, because he basically says a bunch of statements about Apache people. Mm -hmm. Like, there was one thing he said that was effectively... Oh, let me see if I can find it. It was... Uh, oh, he, this is this is a this is a quote directly from a later part of the the story. The Apaches and other Indians of the area had pra many practices that seemed to us cruel, such as killing captured infants. But they would never consider wasting such a supply as meat as a camel. Yeah, I I mean, the, so the, we're we're like peak manifest destiny times, aren't we? Well, no, this is 1961 that this this was written. Oh shit! All right, so no, also, the 1800s is the manifesties. Yeah, we're we're also still not great about this when it comes to Native Americans. Nope, like real bad about it actually. Uh, to the point that it's super upsetting. Um. So, for those who don't know, uh, Geronimo was a prominent Apache leader in the 1800s who literally fought the U.S. and Mexico for Apache rights. Is the red ghost part, is the red part the racist part? No. Okay. Actually, it's not. That's not the racist part. The racist That's part, surprising. The racist part is all the shit that they pulled in about Native Americans for no good reason. Like, there was yeah. no good reason for him to accuse the native americans of being responsible not even accuse he was like it was one of those things where he was like saying oh no it couldn't be these guys because of this reason but it was like such a backhanded compliment or such a backhanded like uh like freeing them from guilt for this thing and it's just like why'd you say it that way you didn't have to say it that way <laughs> um so uh as America is America, uh, they have been translating Geronimo's memory ever since. Uh, that's the whole, like, Geronimo, when you jump out of a plane. Um, they named the operation to kill Osama bin Laden Operation Geron Geronimo. And uh, let's just say his descendants were not happy. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, and I don't I blame them. Yep. I really don't. <laughs> Considering that uh, America captured Geronimo as a pow for like the last 30 years of his life and like used him in like uh wild west shows and shit like that it was it was it was nasty it was gross mm -hmm. um that being said the history of geronimo is a podcast in and of itself as i've alluded to and it should be handled by someone who is far better at that kind of topic than i am Oh, I bet there, 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 there's got to be a dollop that involves something somewhere at some point. Surprisingly not. I actually looked it up because I was curious because I, wa I wanted to listen to an episode like that. That's definitely a dollop-worthy story, though, from what I read. Um, because if you've listened to the dollop at all, uh, the running theme of the dollop is we're terrible. Oh, yeah. well, the, And by we're, the, I mean Americans. The, the theme is American history. <laughs> 
Yeah, which is which is just all terrible. terrible things. Yeah, yeah. The, the theme is American history, and American history is terrible. Mm-hmm. We are terrible. The story. Um, so skipping past the honestly and unsurprisingly racist frame pre- presented by the a- author, this story begins in the spring of 1883 when two unnamed women were alone with their children in an adobe house on the Eagle Creek. Now, I tried to look up what the name of these two women were. Couldn't find it. I couldn't even find the family name for the house, which was surprising, because usually at the very least, like, the last name's there or the name of the husband or what yeah. have you. Because the, these were married women who had children, and they were just, like, kind of living in the same house. So I'm assuming it was, like, a a settling situation where two families joined together to impre- improve their odds, so to speak. Mm. Um. Sometime in the morning, one of the women had gone to gather water from the home's nearby spring when the dog began barking. As the tale goes, the barking brought the other woman to the window, at which point she, they saw something red, enormous, and ridden by the devil. Wait, is it like a big red camel that's being ridden by the devil? Well, let's get into it. We're, we're not there yet, Brandon. It is reported that the woman then heard screams from outside and she barricaded the door shut, spending the remainder of the day in prayer. The husbands, I assume, of the women returned that night to hear the account of the woman who had successfully barricaded herself indoors. The woman who had gone to get water was not so lucky. Her body was found by torchlight trampled nearly flat at the edge of the spring. Oh. Not right. Not a fun way to no. go. Uh the nearby mud had cloven hoof prints twice the size of a horse's and long red hairs could be found in the surrounding foliage. So, uh, basically this woman got trampled to death by something huge that had hooves. Oh, Uh, the coroner was suspicious of this story and in a rare case of, I said Occam's razor, but that's not really it. It's like general healthy skepticism. Uh, for the show, they assumed that it would have been more likely that she'd been murdered by a family member. And as a result, held a coroner's inquest. Yeah. Um, however, the state of the trampled body and the strange footprints resulted in the jury returning the verdict of death in some unknown manner. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, really, really great verdict. Yeah. Uh, very descriptive. Yeah. Very descriptive. So, I personally delved into the digital versions of the Mojave County Minor, which supposedly was the source of this information, uh, but I couldn't find a record. That's not to say it doesn't exist, because there's an article from the Mojave County uh, Minor that I pulled later in this episode that does exist. Um, I'm just really not good at delving papers from the 1800s. They're really hard to read. Oh, yeah. Because it's like just a bunch of columns, and like... It's a bunch of columns with real tiny, like, print... Yeah. And it's like, sometimes it's a little bit blurry. I'm also never sure if I'm reading an article, a story, or an ad. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) To be totally honest. Like, I have to read it like three times. And that's just, honestly, that's too much time to find find out if uh, this person had been actually trampled to death. Yeah. It's It's a part of the nature of the story. So I'm just going to assume that at the very least... If we're going to be telling this story, we have to make the assumption that this happened. Um, so a few days after the first death, two prospectors were looking for gold in Chase's Creek, a body of water several miles northeast of Eagles Creek. Oh. Which, um, let me just say, so far, this is not like a crazy story in which like the thing is like teleporting around Arizona. It kind of follows like a logical like progression and amount of time for a creature to move across arizona yeah as soon as you said coal miners that i had a flashback of um when you trapped me into doing the scrumpy voice at D D forever well it wasn't a coal miner it was a prospector i did trap you into the scrumpy voice though you did because i had this D D character who i like for some reason I, I decided to do a voice but he could he had different he, he had different disguises so when he was just as scrumpy he he had an old tiny prospector voice, and this bastard locked him in a different dimension with a group of people, so he could never 
get out of that character or else they'd realize he was actually playing these different characters. So I had to bring just like several bottles of water to, with me to yeah. every session. <laughs> So that was my fault, um, but it was also your fault because, you know, you decided to do the most awful voice ever for that character. Oh, yes. Um, it was terrible. Like, and I don't mean terrible as in bad, as in, I mean terrible as in for your throat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, uh, I also think you started to talk in the scrumpy voice. Like on accident, By accident at some point. Yes, yeah. because I was using it for so long, I just like accidentally slip into scrumpy. <laughs> yeah, it was it was funny. Um, oh yeah. You also like uh, the beds because because you were like a inn owner, right? Yes. So the what what had happened was we were getting towards the end of the campaign, and I wasn't sure how I wanted to end it. <laughs> um. Because we've been going this this particular campaign, I've been going for like a year, and it was fully homebrewed. And I I was kind of hitting the point where I couldn't uh, maintain the story anymore because all the threads were starting to come un- unraveled. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the very least, I wanted to put an end to the story. So I sent you guys to the Dreamlands from HP Lovecraft uh, because I wanted to be able to just do non sequiturs for a little bit to kind of like. Um, give myself like a break from the narrative, the strict narrative that I was plotting outside of that world. Uh, but you, for whatever reason, decided to go scrumpy at the exact moment that you, they all got transported to the dreamlands. Yup. <laughs> and there was no way for you to bring back your normal character voice as a result. Yeah. It's terrible. Well, I mean, technically you could have, you just chose to double down. Yeah. Why? Well, I- Figured that that character wouldn't decide to to break his disguise in the context of that group. You have a really bad habit of not breaking character. And I don't say it like as a bad habit. I mean, like, you don't break character. Once you, once you settle on a character, you don't break character. You had to kill a character off because he got too problematic. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I <laughs> once... The character's been around enough where there's just clearly, this is the thing this character would do in this situation. I'm not going to, like, break whatever that character would do. So, like, one I killed, one, um, I think it just made him get drunk and run into the woods. Mm -hmm. Um, like, their characters were just like, this kid, like, they, this, it's the, 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 he's, they've gone too far, (laughs) and I can't... And it won't be in the oeuvre of that character to, like, change how they are. So, like, we're going to get rid of this character, bring this other character, until this other character becomes also problematic. Well, when you got rid of uh, Plundar, it totally threw my character for a loop. Because my character, like, I, I decided to make a character that was, like, totally, um, like, like owed his life, like a life debt type thing to Plundar type. Yeah story um but then Pl- and plundar <laughs> Wait, plundar was evil plundar like, plundar was was going there was too many once the wishbone thing happened the second time then that set that locked plundar into the path that he was on well, and he had to go well then there were multiple wishbones yeah and for those of you who don't know wishbone was uh just a random child that we picked up twice and we gave that wishbone a like uh, uh, like a little little name tag. Yeah, it was. I forgot or couldn't be bothered to remember the name of that non-player character, so I just called them Wishbone because as I for some reason like after the dog from that old TV show, and mm-hmm. then I started to treat them like an animal a little bit, like you know put their food in a bowl and stuff. Yeah, and and, and then. And then Wishbone became not the only Wishbone, and it was actually a history of Wishbones. And my character had all the old Wishbone dog tags. Um, it, it got weird. Yeah. <laughs> of course, then 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 your character Plundar became a like uh, the one who wears the mask, the one who's in the hole type character. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my character kind of became went off the rails after that point and became a little bit too 
powerful, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, which also Gorgo the Wise, <laughs> the the barbarian <laughs> with the high wisdom. <laughs> yep. Oh man, uh, our DM was so mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> so mad at me. I I I actually the highest stat I used was my wisdom. Because yep. I thought it would be funny to have a barbarian whose main attribute was how wise he was and not how strong he was. Yeah. <laughs> so he 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 approached every problem like uh skeptically and like not sure of it, which is the exact opposite of the way most barbarians are played. And I had a lot of fun with that, but it really subverted the DM, who's a first time DM's uh way of handling uh, the campaign. <laughs> it reached a point though that he did have to start like hard targeting Gorgo the Wise, um, to get him to do things. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Gorgo is super racist against the Vistani though. Oh yeah. Oh, for those of you who don't know, it was Curse of Straw we were playing. So, well, for those of you who know what Curse of Straw, yeah. man, we talk about D and D so much on this podcast. Yeah, we assume people know things and Magic the Gather. We talk about a lot of very specific things. It was we a talk campaign about a lot of stuff that Hasbro owns about a vampire that lived in a castle. I mean, Curse of Straw is like one of the most famous D and D modules. Well, yeah, but not everybody play plays. I mean, yeah, that's true. That... <laughs> Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, that's that's my main problem is, like, I exist in such a nerd bubble that I assume everything that I think is popular and famous is famous and popular. Oh, yeah. Well, we've also curated our own friend group in such a way where we assume a lot of people are privy to information that most people wouldn't know, and that assumption is usually correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's it's a little bit startling. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's rough when you encounter someone and they don't know, and it's like, oh, that's that's right. That's not a norm a thing normal people know. Yeah, that's not a normal people thing, and it's also now a thing that I'm either going they to know that you know just change the subject or decide to inflict a lot of information upon you <laughs> that you don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I sent you it, but uh, did you see that? You saw the Tigtone. Uh, the Tigtone yes, which also D &D I, I didn't know what Tigtone was until I Googled it. And I was like, this sounds amazing. I tried to watch Tigtone yesterday and it's uh -huh. not available on the level of Hulu that I have. It's not available on Hulu, period, anymore. It's available if you pay $54 a month. What? Yeah. Hulu has you a... You can pay Fifty four dollars a month. A month because it's Hulu? it's Hulu plus and the live streaming television package. Oh, that's gross. So they have you can it. just watch it. You can just watch it on AdultSwim.com, I think. Okay, I'll have to go check out their website then. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I watched. I watched the whole thing. Um, so when I went to Victoria, Canada, um, I watched the whole thing on the plane. Oh, did and you? I was dying of laughter the whole time. I was probably the most obnoxious plane passenger ever. Oh, God. So, anywho, because we got distracted on prospectors, uh, let's get back to the prospector story. So, in the middle of the night, the prospectors were awakened by their tent crashing down on their heads. They heard a loud scream, the pounding of hooves, and witnessed a huge animal entering the brush. Soon after, the next day, several miners visited the site of the camp, once again finding the prints of huge hooves and long red hair. At this point, the stories of the creatures began to take hold, as it was dubbed the Red Ghost. Tall tales began to spring ring up with one tale teller claiming that the creature had vanished into thin air in front of them, which I think is where the whole ghost thing comes into play, because uh, stories like that started to crop up. Gotcha. Um, and another so, claiming that it had hmm? just for because I had a random thought. Um, so I just looked up um, hooved animals native to uh, Arizona, and there are only it's... four. One's okay. a one's a, a bighorn sheep. The other one's a pronghorn, which is like a deer, uh, a mule deer, which is just another kind of deer, and mm -hmm. 
uh, a pe- peccary, which is like a boar type thing. So there are no yeah. horses or camels or animals similar to those being distri- described that are native to Arizona. To be fair, wild horses are not native to America either, but we had wild horses for a while because people just, because horses got free. Horses got free. Horses be useful. Hmm. Um, so, uh, another story that was told about the red ghost at this time was that they, that a person had seen it kill and eat a grizzly bear. What? That's awesome. That's what, a, that's yeah. kind of badass. Get it, red ghost. Yeah. Yeah. So tales would spread until the supposed red ghost appeared near the Salt River, 80-ish miles north of the first sighting. So um, not an impossible distance to be traveled by a creature. And the timeline of this is not like, it's not like crazy, right? It's not like, it's not like Mothman levels of like everything's happening in like two days type thing. Okay. Uh, So... In this case, we actually have the name of the rancher who encountered the beast. Cyrus Hamblin. Hamblin? Hamblin. Of the Ramblin' Hamblins? Ramblin' Hamblins. Like the the Pied Piper of Hamblin. The Pied Piper of Hamblin. Yep. Yeah. He uh, he controls deli meat. (laughs) He he controls deli meat. Yeah. Uh, The... the... (laughs) Oh, God. He's just, you know, he's hambling around with his, his herd of, of pigs mm-hmm. or whatever you call a group of pigs. I, I'm going to call it a herd for the sake of uh, argument. You're looking it up. Yeah. I assume it would be like a pack because like wild, like it would be wild boars, right? Ah, uh, a group of pigs is called a pestle, a team, or a sounder. Let's never call a group of wild pigs a sound let's never call a group of pigs a sounder again (laughs) if you don't know what it is don't google it pass all why do we have word why do we have uh because why can't you just say pigs plural why do we need a separate word for group because english is terrible when we could just say a group of pigs because english is terrible how many times do i have to explain they're like did you see that passel? And you have to go, what's a passel? Oh, you know a passel. It's like a sounder. You're like, what the fuck's a sounder? They go, oh, it's a team. A team of what? Because a team in in one context could be specific to pigs or specific to any group of people working together. Yeah. I hate Just the a- English language. <laughs> I hate the English language as well. It's awful. It's it's the worst. I've haven't I've had to do a lot of writing lately, and it makes me appreciate how much I hate the English language. Oh, and by the way, that was only the American v- words for groups of pigs. If we go to, mm, let's pick another random English-speaking country, England, then it's called a drift, a drove, or a litter. I hate it. Like, wha- uh, why? 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 Why are Why are we so complicated? I don't know. Although, um, what should we call it? I, I think I read this recently. Uh, like the original word for bear, I think is lost. Oh, that's fun. Um, because, uh, yeah. So, so in the Proto-Germanic tribes, they had a term arcto, which replaced their original word for bear. Because it was a euphemistic expression out of fear that saying the animal's true name would cause it to appear. That's amazing. They were so afraid of bears that they that they were afraid that if they said the bear's true name, it would show up. That I mean, bears were a problem. You've seen the bear armor where it's just uh, regular clothing covered in spikes. Also, a group yeah. of giraffes is called a tower, and a group of flamingos is called a flamboyance. Okay, I'll give the group of flamingos credit because a flamboyance is the perfect uh, group name for oh, a group yeah. of flamingos. It's perfect. There's there is nothing else. Um, remember that time we made bear armor for a uh, a character in yes. D20 Modern? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that DM let us get away with too much. Yeah, we built armor for a bear and then we gave the bear lots of drugs and let it loose in a house. Yeah, and then we fought a cloud-looking dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was a weird campaign. Anywho, uh, so Hamblin had been out hunting for stray cattle 
when he noticed a huge reddish animal moving through the brush on the other side of a nearby ravine. Able to watch the creature from safety, Hamblin got the best look at the supposed monster. It was a camel. Huh. Okay, yeah, so is it, it was, an actual out of place uh, animal? From it like, is an actual camel. Dope. Okay, so I, like right up the top, I I kind of my guess was it wasn't far off. No, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, it was a camel. Dope. It was a literal camel. Hell yeah. So, camels, as Brandon has pointed out, are not not naturally indigenous to the Arizona region. However. Camels have been a fairly common sight in the American West, which was news to me. Why? And news to me. Yeah. So camel caravans uh, happen a lot between San Antonio and Los Angeles. Um, huh. And in fact, prior to the Civil War, Congress had approved $30,000 for the purchase of camels. What? In fact, if the if the Civil War hadn't happened, their use probably would have been more like adopted. That's crazy. Yeah, um, there's a whole story about it, and the the author talks about it. But basically what happened was um, camels are way more moody than horses. Oh. Like, they're more independent. Camels are more um, like the teenager of, of hooved animals. Well, they're really good animals, and they're really, like, strong. And actually, in terms of being a pack animal, like a, a, like a pack load animal, they're better than, like, a mule. Um but the problem is the way that American Westerners treated horses and mules was with such an insane amount of cruelty uh, that while they were the, – the horses and mules had basically been bred to deal with that, camels were not used to that in any way, shape, oh, or form. Oh, they were too sassy. And they got really, really uh, – they, they were not happy with uh, – with, with people. people. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, somebody who drove mules was called a mule skinner because they would literally hit the mule so hard that it would, like, cause the skin to get torn off. Cool. Welcome to the, t- welcome to the terrible stuff of the American North, uh, the American West. Yeah. Uh, so, the, although, as we can tell due to the fact that the setting was shocking, it never caught on, as I mentioned before. Hamlin's story doesn't end there, however. After realizing that this creature was a Camlin, a Camblin. A Camlin? A Camblin along. A, cam- <laughs> a Camblin. Hi, he I'm saw Todd some- Cam- Hamblin. This is my camel. I call him Ted Hamblin. God. The Hamblin Camblin. Um, so uh, he realized that there was something on the camel's back. Uh-huh. While he didn't get a great look, he was convinced it was a dead man. Oh. So, with that sighting made by a sober, well-regarded rancher, Arizona had a resident legend. Called the Red Ghost by the English-speaking residents and the Phantasma Colorado by the Spanish-speaking people, it began to crop up in other areas of the state. So, it was a camel. This is like a a headless horseman thing then almost, but instead of a horse, it's a camel. Instead of a man with no head, it's a zombie? That's what I thought. When I uh, started the research for this story, okay, but let's get let's keep going. Okay, I like where this is going. Um, I I think I think it's called a ghost more because of like how ephemeral it is, so to speak. If that makes sense, like how frequently it kind of like just fades in and out. Like it's not like ever in one place too long. Okay, because so far so everything it's like a wanderer described huh? has been wholly corporeal. So it's more that that the how it pops in and out. Yeah, gotcha. There's. The only instance of it being incorporeal was in one story where the person said it disappeared, but that okay. was like that was like a tall tale. the The stories with physical evidence all like indicate that it's like a, a flesh and blood camel. Okay. So people weren't convinced that the camel had a dead rider, assuming instead it was just a loose camel from some caravan or another, until the red ghost appeared near the valley of the Verde River a few weeks later, some 60 miles west of Hamblin's Ranch. So once again, time frame, totally reasonable for a camel to move that distance. Yeah. A few weeks to move 60 miles, totally within the realm of possibility for a camel, especially in Arizona, which is desert. Right? Which actually I found something out. Um, Camels don't store extra water. They're just really, really good at not sweating. Oh, 
Okay. Their, their body their body temperature is really tolerant. So yeah. like it's like it can reach like eight ninety or one hundred and thirty degrees uh, or one hundred some odd degrees, um, no problem. So they don't have to sweat and they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. It's just they're literally just built different. Huh. So uh, they're the way that they maintain homeostasis is different than they do than any other creature, basically. Yeah. It's actually really cool. Um, uh, but that whole thing about, you know, the camel's hump having the water in it or yeah. the stomach having water in it, not true. What? Okay. Not true. Uh, this is full the, of the camel fat things. Does, yeah, the fat doesn't contain more water and there's no, like, special lining in the stomach. It's literally just they don't sweat as much. Huh. Yeah. Um, and they're they're more tolerant of dehydration, mm. basically. That's that's really all it is. Um, so this time, a, five co- prospectors encounter the creature on a mesa. Being an American in a cryptopia story told by me, they shot at the camera, the camel. <laughs> it's so I, I'm actually a little bit surprised nobody tried to just take pot shots at it earlier. Yeah, no. This is the first time that someone's tried to shoot at the camel. Which, uh, for a story from me for Cryptopedia. That's a fairly long time period for someone to not attempt to shoot at a, cre- a creature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, this is a record. Um, so they missed it and caused it to run off. As it ran away, however, something fell from its back. A human skull complete with shreds of flesh and hair. Nice! Now we have an actual headless... What do you call a camel rider? Camelman. So at this point, the Red Ghost had become a mainstay of Arizona's territory, er, ter, Arizona Territory's folklore. And I have a little picture in the show notes of... It's a uh, pretty good picture. Yeah, that was what actually inspired me to, to do this. The camel having, like, a, a skeleton riding on its back. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's an angry-looking camel. Oh, it's a very... I Well, we're going to get into that. Uh, the camel was definitely definitely had a right to be angry. <laughs> Wait, we there there's an actual camel? Like there's a specific camel. Maybe. <laughs> there's a specific camel? There might be a specific camel for it. That's pretty amazing. So, in the 10 years succeeding the initial sighting of the camel, the camel was seen again a number of times. In one case, a cowboy ne- near Phoenix had seen skeletal human remains on the back of a red camel. Um he had actually tried to like capture it with like a rope and huh. failed. But, like, it was, like, a legitimate camel that had skeleton on it. Um, Sweet. In a far stranger incident, however, a freighter had stopped his wagon train on the banks of the Verde River when the following happened. And this is this is a quote from the uh, primary, the, the source that I'm using for this episode. Um, As they told it, they had unhitched and hobbled their mules and were bedded down for the night when the comfortable silence was abruptly rent by an unearthly scream. A great beast, which they estimated to be at least 30 feet high, flapped down into their mists on black wings that covered the whole sky. The landing jarred the ground like an earthquake and knocked over two of the wagons. Terrified men and mules scattered in all directions, including the river. When the men crept back to their camp the next morning... The only bits of evidence they could find were the prints of huge cloven hooves and a few red hairs sticking to one of the overturned wagons. Brandon, that's a Thunderbird story in the middle of the Red Ghost. Yeah. That's like, there was a Thunderbird and then also the Red Ghost happened to come by after? Yeah. Yeah, so I read that and I'm just like, what? Like, what? What? What is this? What yeah. is this thing that I'm reading right now? Um, that being said, the wagon caravan, Brandon? Yeah. It did have several kegs of whiskey. Why would you ask that question? <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't know. But, like, I mean, this is also, I think, fairly close to the time period that the... Thunderbird was popular in Arizona. Um, let me see. I'm, I'm going to open up our... I, I should have opened this up beforehand, but I'm lazy. Uh-huh. Um, um, do we... What is? Do, what was the name of our Thunderbird episode? I know that the, let's see. Uh, episode number uh, 22, go. Too Many Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds. 
Oh no. And we had yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh no, that's part two. So this is part one. There's Thunderbirds again, episode twenty. So this this would be actually square in the time range of when the first modern modern Thunderbird was sighted. Okay. Um, because the tombstone epitaph article that we talked about in the first episode of the Thunderbird stuff was April twenty sixth, eighteen ninety. And this is within the 10 years after 1883. So this is this is possibly in the middle. This story is possibly told in the middle of Thunderbirds being a thing. Oh, um, okay. That makes sense. I'm not exactly sure when. So so the main problem I have with the, the source that I use this episode is they didn't, like, do good citation. So I couldn't, like, find the exact dates for any of these things. Because even though I have access to the newspapers... Like, we're talking about a 10-year period for a weekly newspaper. That's 520 issues. <laughs> I'm not going to go through 520 issues for a single episode of Cryptopedia. Yeah, yeah, fair. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, so, I just think it's kind of cool. And, I like, I have no idea why the Red Ghost is... Like, the only reason the Red Ghost is even remotely related to this is because of the hoof prints in the, in the, the red, red fur. hair. Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise this would just be a Thunderbird story. So I, I don't know, but a weird happenstance. Um, so I guess there is actually a cryptid in this week's episode. Um, that being said, it's likely that the majority of accounts attributed to the Red Ghost were tall tales or misattributions. But Brandon. Yes. Did that camel actually exist? That's what I want to know. You said there's a specific camel. So I want to know about this specific camel. So, early in the life of the legend of the Red Ghost, the running hypothesis was that the corpse that had provided the skull was, in fact, from a thirsty traveler who had lashed himself to the back of a camel, hoping it would bring him to water. Ah, okay. So, um, the camel apparently didn't go to water quick enough, or uh, he lashed himself and couldn't unlash himself, or something along those lines would be the the narrative. Mm -hmm. Um. And, uh, yeah, but without capturing a camel or, like, investigating a camel or anything like that, there's literally no way to verify that. It's just a hypothesis, right? Yeah. However, in the February 25th, 1893 issue of the Mojave County Minor, okay. this more, legend more or less comes to a close. Mizu Hastings of Orr or or a woke up to a large red camel eating his termit patch. In response, Mizu shot the camel dead. <laughs> of co of course, or you could just shoo it away. <laughs> yeah. So the state of the camel was not great. When he went out to examine the beast, he found that it was all scarred up and had evidently had a very hard time. He was covered with a perfect network of knotted rawhide strips. They had been on him so long, the strands had cut their way into the flesh. Oh, that's... Oh, that's sad. Yeah, so it turns out the Red Ghost was, in fact, a act of prodigious animal abuse in which someone had strapped someone else to the back of a camel 10 years prior to the death of the camel. Oh, Jesus. The camel had been walking around the Arizona desert for 10 years. <laughs> it's it's bad yeah and, like not great not no. great and not only that but we don't know if the person who was attached to the camel was living or dead when they were attached yeah i would assume living it's it'd be weird to tie a, a dead guy to a cam like it'd be weirder to tie a dead guy to a camel than it would be to tie a living guy to a camel yeah but it's the american it's the american west brandon yeah yeah it's a weird place in general. Or. Or. The camel was into leather stuff. I don't think a camel is going to be in leather into leather stuff as a rule. Don't kink shame the also, camel. Th I No, I, I also don't think that camels can give consent. Um, They can't communicate consent. With another camel, perhaps. Not with a human, because camels can't tie knots. I mean, prove that they can't. I've never seen a camel tie knot. That doesn't mean they can't. Maybe they just choose I, not to in my presence. I, 
I think, Brandon, that you have the order of operations for the scientific method screwed up there. <laughs> John, prove this negative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Prove God doesn't exist. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, open a window. <laughs> God damn it, Brandon. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, oh, geez. So the only thing that we really know for certainty is that whoever tied this poor camel up was a cruel bastard. That's That's really all we know. Yeah, that that um, took a dark turn. Yeah. Um, See, in my head, so, I, I was picturing like a saddle, and like s- some guy died, and like his legs didn't come out of little saddle strappy bits. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. This was. Um. So I read this. So let me tell you my my process for reading this episode. Um. I was looking for something uh, a little different. I thought I was going to do an episode on Mothman, like similar things that were similar things that were similar to Mothman, but all the ones that I tried to look into, I can only find sources on like paranormal websites. I couldn't find any like actual news articles for any yeah, of them. It was all like even though they green text place, sites. Yeah, even though they took place in the seventies when there should have definitely been newspaper articles about them. Yeah. Um so I I was looking through my list and I found this, the red ghost, in my list, because I had I'd seen that picture previously and I was like Oh, that looks like a cool episode to talk about because it's a cool picture. So that means it's going to be a cool episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cause that's how my brain works. And so I read it and I was writing it as I, 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 I was writing as I was reading yeah. and synthesizing and cause you know, whatever. Um, when I got to the part where the head fell off the camel, I was like, Oh wait, this is an actual camel. <laughs> Because I thought, based on the picture, that it was like a uh, we were dealing with a um, like a sleepy hollow type yeah, like situation. a spoopy sleepy hollow headless horseman, but in Arizona, so it's a camel. Yeah, it wasn't. It was an actual camel. <laughs> and at that point, I was just like, "Well, now we have to do this episode." Yeah, because this is like the weirdest thing I've ever read. This is one of the weirder things I've ever read because it's like real <laughs> yeah and somehow that was more horrifying to me than you know some of the horrifying shit that we've read that isn't real <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah um that was the red ghost brandon not a very long story but man is it a is it a different story it's different it's very different in and weirdly educational yeah, um, I mean, I didn't go into a whole... I, I tried to avoid... I didn't want to go into Native American relations too much because, uh, for whatever reason, the author decided that it was a very relevant thing to the story when it literally had no relation whatsoever to any part of it. Um, no, but I learned that camels in the U.S. are a thing. Yeah, yeah, I actually... I think I knew that. It was one of those things where I think I've heard about it in the past. Um... So, like, when I was reading it, I was like, oh, this this could be this, yada, yada, yada type thing. Um, but, yeah, it was... I was surprised. Yeah. I was surprised. Um, so, as always, if you enjoy the podcast, our website is CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram and Twitter are at CryptopediaCast. Our email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. We do have a Patreon. Uh, there are several tiers, and the Jackalopes get thanks. So, Brandon, why don't you thank our Jackalopes this week? I shall do that once I scroll. There we go. <laughs> yes. So this time we'll thank Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, who I forgot the narrative that I invented for Bird Schneider, where uh, I was in hollow it. Hollow bones. Well, it's a hollow bones. He got the surgery. Did he got the bones filled. Did he? They. I'll have to try to think of something about like physical therapy type stuff. Eventually, but, well, he's going assume... to have dense bones, like yeah, you, it's the opposite. John, it's the guy, the boy that doesn't float, and Jonathan Shepard. Brandon, do you know how hard it was for me to float? In a pool. 
There's you are neutrally kid, buoyant. Brandon, like I'm not joking. So so when I was in Boy Scouts, they have like a requirement where you like for swimming where you had to like float um in a pool for a certain period and like swim on your back and all that shit. Yeah. Brandon, it took me multiple days to get to the point where I could float on my back. <laughs> Multiple days. Uh, to the point that I was, like, as a kid, crying because I couldn't do it. I could swim. I was capable of swimming. I wasn't capable of floating. <laughs> I guess that just goes to show you I was a ball of literal energy when I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you. you were a child who, who could swim but not float. Yeah. <laughs> like... Well, uh, also, when I was younger, I had, like, 0% body fat, practically. Yeah. I was a skinny kid. But corpses float. <laughs> I know. Corpses float. Yeah. But I didn't. <laughs> uh, we, have a, we have a Facebook group. Um, we have one person who posts some really cool stuff there. Uh, he posts on Mondays, I think, if my memory is correct. It's really cool. He's, he's posted some really yeah, cool stuff. I didn't stuff. realize there was a trend to it, but I, I should have probably realized that earlier. I'm really good at noticing trends, I feel like. so. I am not. Yeah, I. It, it's a little... My, my brain is very adapted for finding patterns, which is very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I love how the human brain is like um if you think about all the things that the human brain is designed to do like they all make sense when you you think about it as though a caveman is doing it. Oh yeah. When you think about it as though a person who has to live in modern society is doing it, it's all horrifying. Yeah, well we made it this far because of our cave, caveman brain and now caveman brain is why like bigfoots exist because pareidolia well, the other thing, too, is, like, anxiety. Yeah. Really super useful in caveman days. Mm -hmm. Because somebody with high anxiety wouldn't get killed by a tiger. Yeah. Now, someone with high anxiety wants to die. <laughs> wants to be killed by that tiger. <laughs> and then we get the Tiger King. And then we get the Tiger King. Uh-huh. Oh, man, that, that show... That's one of those shows that will ne there, like that whole sector of society will never get another show made about it because now that whole sector of society is suspicious. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, they're they're all like that. Just there's like a zero percent chance that Carol Baskins will ever do another interview. Oh yeah, because because they super imply that she murdered her husband. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Well, listen. Here's the here's the thing. They didn't imply anything. They put her in front of a camera, and she was like, "I would never chop up his body and do this and do this incredibly specific thing." Ha 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 ha. Ah, oh. That's fucking. I. I for some reason reminding remembering the the second husband dressed up as a a cat. And I don't know if that's true or if that's just my brain, um, my brain filling in the blanks with something that I thought would be funny. There's maybe he looks when whenever he's around, like there's no way he's into the things, so he's purely there out of like either fear or like she's like crazy in the bedroom. Because he's, she's always, like, yeah. doing this weird stuff, and he's always just standing around awkwardly, clearly not into it. Yeah, like... Um... Oh. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. <laughs> you, you're, okay, you're making so Google face. I wasn't... I wasn't totally imagining this. <laughs> this, this... This was in my brain. Um... Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I, I thought so. This is this is Carol Baskin's uh, newer husband, 
who has a collar on and is wearing a caveman leopard outfit. print caveman outfit. And he's got like a face on. Also, they definitely they definitely did wear cat outfits in one of the video in like one of the, the pictures. Oh yes. So I, I was not going crazy. Um but yeah, no, he's he she has got to be doing something phenomenal. Oh um to him because like there's no reality in which that's not the case. <laughs> that's a whole that's a steaming bag of of yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I know crazy is not a great word, but like like I don't have a better word for it. So No, it is like his body language, like he's he she definitely is likes whatever's going on and he like has an awkward smile and is leaning away from both her and the cat. Yep. So I I I don't know what she does to him, but it's got to be good. Yeah, like he, <laughs> like he's got some crazy kink, and that she is okay. Also with it. shares, like, and she she indulges, and nobody yeah, else she indulges. Would... That's that's we don't know what it is. There's no there's no libel or anything here. There's something going on though. There's something where like no other human. Once they found out what his thing was, wanted to be near him, she indulges and therefore he tolerates that shit that I'm seeing on the screen right now. Uh, that's the only. Uh, that's the only explanation. Oh like, yeah. Literally, the only explanation I can think of. Oh yeah. The, and whatever it is that she's indulging, like it needs two car batteries to run. I At don't. Least. I don't know what it is. Well, Brandon, here's the real question. Is it two car batteries in serial or in parallel? Because that impacts. No, listen. It it only needs one. The other one's for him. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. And here's the thing. Now that I'm looking at the picture where he's wearing a collar... He doesn't yeah. look like he's tolerating the collar. He looks like he's fine with it. Oh no, he definitely looks fine with a collar. Like he he's he's not fine with dressing up like a cat in that other picture, but he's totally cool with that collar. So Oh no, definitely, definitely. There's There's Yeah, oh yeah, no. If you look at the if you look at his face in the cat dress up picture, he, he's dying inside. Yeah. That is the man who's dead. If you look at the the picture of him in the 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 collar, that is a man who has a massive boner. That is, he's making the face of, get these cameras out of here so we can start doing the thing that I want to start doing. Yeah, get these cameras out. It's time. It's not get this collar off. It's get these cameras out. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Oh. Uh. You can find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brendan at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at cryptobrandon. And if you are a follower, um, I posted a video of, uh, um, uh, oh, why am I right now drawing up? Gilbert Gottfried <laughs> just <laughs> saying the lyrics of WAP. <laughs> God, I saw that. It was amazing. Uh, oh. Uh-huh. So, uh, if you want to follow me, I'm Instagram at Mew2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is JohnDunhamGames.com. My email is John at CryptopediaCast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is GreaterGloryCo.com. And his email is TomMikeHill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are so far past the point of weird, I don't even know where we are anymore. <laughs> Also, unrelated, I noticed halfway through the episode that one of my Transformers is missing a part, and it's been driving me crazy for literally half the episode. (laughs) What's it missing? Uh, My, this blaster is missing one of its effects parts, and I'm nervous that the cat stole it. Oh, the green, the green green? Yeah, there's supposed to be two.
And um, the, that's been on my mind. The for good news is you could probably, um, with like some products from Smooth On, like make it, like mold the other one. Pour in a the only problem plastics. is it's that like it's that like uh, soft plastic. Oh. Uh, which is a little trickier to. It's a little trickier to use Smooth On with it. That's yeah. all. That's all. 